Today, we're going to be speaking with veteran marketing executive Ken Turner, who early this year was appointed chief marketing officer at Fanatics Collectibles. He was previously the executive vice president and CMO at Red Bull, one of my favorite brands. And he was recently recognized by Savoy Magazine as one of the top most influential black executives in corporate America for 2022. Ken, so looking forward to this. Great to see you today. Great to see you as well. Thank you for having me. This should be fun. Absolutely. So I was looking through your background, as I always do, in, in prepping for this podcast. And one question that came up off the bat is, you know, you graduated from Marquette and then you went into the workforce and then decided to go back and get your MBA in marketing. When you look back on that decision, was that the right decision? Because there's a lot of discussion now is, is college worth it? Is getting your MBA worth it? What, what are your feelings on the topic? You know, I, I actually get this question a, a lot and it really, it really depends on why you're going back. So, so I was in a world that was finance driven, a little bit of technology, uh, and it wasn't what I really wanted to do. So I went back to get an MBA to switch careers. It is difficult to switch careers or switch functions, uh, in your current organization if you are a specialist in something. Right. And so it was almost like a reset for me. Uh, right. What I tell people is if you're going back to get an MBA to do the things that you're already currently doing, it's probably not a good idea to do it. Yeah. Um, even organizations recognize that uh, it's probably not as necessary. I will tell you, like some folks will say, I went to Northwestern uh, and uh, Kellogg is recognized as one of the, the, the greatest marketing schools in the world. Absolutely. I didn't take, I didn't take many marketing classes. Um, I, I took more organizational behavior and and finance classes because all the marketers that I knew said, whenever you go to wherever organization you'll be, they'll teach you marketing. So it's not necessarily about the education, uh, but if you want to switch careers, I'd say the other thing, uh, there's three things. The second thing is the network's phenomenal. Uh, I've met some of my closest friends uh, by kind of doing the, the, the yeah. MBA and going back to going back to school. Uh, and the third thing is the network continues to be uh, amazing. Uh, so having uh, kind of a Northwestern MBA or whatever it is, uh, network of folks you can tap into, not necessarily for work or jobs, uh, but just to have an education or, or to talk to folks about things. Um, it's it's pretty cool. Um, if I had to do it again, I, someone asked me this before, I, I probably wouldn't do it. I probably, knowing what I know now, I probably would have started in marketing <laughs> uh, right. and, and probably not done the finance. Thing but you didn't know what you know now. And that's, it's exactly. Right. Exactly. That's, that's a great point. Yeah. And what's interesting is when you were at Kellogg and you started there, it looks like in 2003, and it makes sense to me that you wouldn't learn marketing because I doubt the professors would have been able to prepare you for the change that was about to happen over the next 10 to 15 years in digital. I mean, in 2003, Facebook was barely invented. There was no YouTube. There was no iPhone. <laughs> you know, the, all the things that shape modern culture and modern marketing didn't exist yet. So anything you would have been taught probably would have been dated. By the time you got out yeah. and actually got into the real world, especially for brands like Red Bull, would you would you where you would later work, which is one of the most progressive yeah. marketers really in history. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was a that's a long time ago. Thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah, exactly. That. We're going way back. <laughs> and we're working way back in the future. So, and then you know, I, I would tell you though. Oh, sorry, I didn't interrupt you. I would tell you though. In, in, in two thousand, two thousand three, if you remember, like that. That was the those were the years of consulting and investment bankers. Like everyone wanted to be on the street. Like everyone yeah. wanted to either be on the street or or in consulting because that's where the opportunities. I mean, that was right before kind of the the mid like two thousand five two thousand six, where all of a sudden the job market wasn't as 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 good. But it was right before that, and so it was like one of those things where everyone was like, "Hey, right, let's 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 do a little bit more of of consulting and let's do a bit of more of, of banking." And so no one was really talking about marketing in the way uh, that we talk about it now experiential marketing that you see at, at Red Bull, that wasn't a thing. No one was yeah. really, really doing that. Yeah, it was about big budgets, big, big advertising budgets. Well, and, because it and was before the TV. internet took off as a mainstream consumption habit. It, so the only way brands could it, build their brands are rank 30 second spots. So the notion 30, of 30 second spots. marketing didn't exist, you know? And, and freestanding inserts. Like you remember those, those promo, oh, yeah, uh, promotional promotional things. But, yeah, right? And then the, the mailing, like, so you get the, the, the little things in the mail, right, mail. the snail mail. Yeah. Yeah. So those, I mean, those were the marketing levers of the day back then. Yeah. And, and so after Kellogg, you, you spent, and I'm saying 10 years at SC Johnson, um, obviously yeah. one of the preeminent CPG um, companies in the world. And it definitely is a common theme at the Speed of Culture podcast, where we speak to people who are in prominent positions like yourself, who cut their teeth, got their chops, so to speak, at a large CPG like Procter & Gamble or SC Johnson or Unilever. Um, 
why is going that path sort of right out of getting your MBA right out of school a good one? What do you learn from working at a CPG that's applicable to other things you do? Yeah, we talked about it a little bit earlier. You, you kind of learn what you don't know. Like it, right. you don't know what you don't know. And going into a CPG organization that has some tradition, it helps you to, to understand that. Uh, there's probably three things I would say um, I learned from, from working at SC Johnson. One is process. Um, I mean, SC Johnson is probably 150 years old right now. Uh, and yeah. you don't get to be a fifth or sixth generation organization without having some process and some clarity with respect to, to what it is you want to do. So process isn't it doesn't exist to slow you down. It's, it, it's there to make you more efficient. So how do you get through things and do things with, uh, with impact? Uh, process kind of helps you that. So that's, that's kind of one. The second is foundation for what's important with respect to marketing. Uh, and that is, that is the consumer. Uh, it is consumer centric a marketing. Uh, it is a marketing led organization. And there's nothing like being in a marketing led organization, uh, because at the end of the day, the, we all know the consumer, the fan, the collector, whomever it may be. They decide, uh, but being in an organization that thinks consumer first uh, and then goes to product based on the consumer, it helps you to understand the importance of the, of the consumer. Uh, and the third thing is I didn't realize, um, as I look back, I didn't realize how much I would actually like marketing. Uh, I actually thought I'd go to SC Johnson for a couple of years and then figure out how to get back to finance um, because I wanted to be a general marketer. Uh, and, and then it was the love of the con consumer and the impact that those brands made on the consumer is that, you know what, this is pretty cool. Like if you think about the role of marketing uh, to motivate uh, a consumer, a spectator, an audience to think, to feel, to do yeah. in a positive way, um, that was just kind of where I wanted to be. And it's like, this is this is really cool. I'm, I'm glad I did this. Yeah, I mean, the, I'm always asked why I love marketing so much. And I just love the notion that you could dictate another human's behavior through yeah. strategy and through delivering on their unmet needs. It's just a, a lifelong challenge to be a great marketer. You never fully succeed. There's always more to uncover, more insights to cover, more uncover, more consumers to learn about and impact. Yeah, and it, it, it's, I always tell people, um, there's so many different ways to get to a point in, in finance, which I mean, I still love Excel. Um, there's an answer, right? It's, yeah, there's an R squared. There's a regression. Um, and marketing, you have an opportunity to explore, uh, to do something different, to reach the same point, exactly as you said, to, to motivate a consumer's behavior, which is really, really cool. Absolutely. And one company that has really been incredibly effective at motivating consumers' behavior is Red Bull, who really yeah. invented, in my uh, mind, the, the energy drink category. When you joined Red Bull in 2015, they had already kind of rose to dominance um, and and you joined as director of marketing and worked your way up uh, to CMO. You know, when, when I think of Red Bull, I think of, you know, lifestyle marketing and I think of a company that really sort of um, embedded their entire strategy around the notion of extreme, right? And they just owned extreme across the board. When you joined, that strategy was kind of off the ground, but I imagine you were tasked over your, over your career there as you progress with kind of expanding that. Um, how were you able to do that and, and kind of what were the um, handprints that you left on Rebel during your time there? You know, I, Rebel's a great organization. It's one of the best, if not the best, that I've ever been uh, associated with. Uh, when, when the organization called me, I was working on Ziploc. I actually thought it was a mistake. Oh, hey, you got the wrong person. Uh, but what they explained to me was, hey, we've got this, this great organization uh, that's really known for marketing. Uh, now we've introduced competition. Competition is, is there. Uh, yeah. We've got extreme athletes. They have extreme athletes. We've got experiences. They've got experiences. Yeah. So they've blurred the lines of competition. And when you blur the lines of competition, consumers or shoppers are left to pick on the thing that they know, which is price. Right. Uh, and so the, the, the role or the, the, the expectation was, how do you come in? and really set ourselves apart with some really strong brand foundation. So they were looking for someone with a foundation like an Essie Johnson or a typical CPG uh, to say, hey, let's let's figure out what we do in order to have some distinction, not differentiation. Differentiation is, is short term. Distinction is long term. How do we distinguish ourselves from from the other brands? Um, my response to, to Rebel at the time was 
you're making a mistake. <laughs> don't hire, don't hire anybody in traditional CPG because they're going to come in and they're going to do DRTV. They're going to try to do right. FSIs. They're going to try to do all the things that you don't do. And your brand is, is amazing and, and, and special. Um, and then the conversation turned because I was a big follower of Ripple content. Uh, and I asked, Hey, as a follower of content, uh, you have some amazing things out there. How come you don't ever ask me to buy your product? Uh, right. and I said, not, and now you know why we're talking to you. Uh, and so it was one of those things where you kind of come in. It's at the time, Red Bull was a great organization, um, continues to be a great organization. It was from a household penetration and things have been flat. So the, the role and the, the, the conversation was how do we continue to grow the category through household penetration while elevating the brand, um, and uh, allowing ourselves to, to offer some, some distinction. So that's kind of what we did. Like when I started in Chicago, it was really more how do we test and learn some things that we may pilot for the future. As you mentioned, the, the brand was already strong, really based in, I would say, uh, a couple of things, strong experiences from an event marketing, a really strong sampling program, and a history of sports and extreme. Uh, and then also there was the other aspect of it, which from an on-premise standpoint, which is like the nightlife. So do you choose to embrace uh, some of those things or yeah. do you choose to move away? Because that uh, happened so sort we, of organically, the, the whole Red Bull exactly. craze was something that Rebel didn't push in the beginning. It just, the on-premise business kind of just, you know, on its own just took off. Yeah. And even to this day, Rebel doesn't push the on-premise, but it's just, like you said, it, it happens, happens organically. Uh, and so the, the question is of, of those levers, which, which do you keep? You still want to engage with consumers, with spectators and audiences in real life. Uh, and so that remains the same. You still want to make sure that things that are happening organically continue to happen organically. Having a can in the hand from a sampling program, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so the opportunity became, how do you expand your brand outside of extreme sports? Uh, so how do you do things that are really more mainstream playgrounds? Uh, right. How do you do things in basketball by signing an athlete or having a team deal? How do you do things in football? How do you do things in baseball? And so those are kind of the things that we kind of learned and, and tried. Uh, and then we came up with a really cool strategy to kind of implement and, and execute. Uh, to get to the last point of your question, um, if, if I were to say one of the things that maybe two things um, that we kind of did at Red Bull uh, that I'm proud of, the one is the introduction, introduction I should say, of, of process and the introduction of marketing language, uh, right. ideas of household penetration, buy rate, which you learn requirements. Exactly. Right? right. And those things become kind of, I mean, it's, it's the way that the marketers talk now, which is, which is really, really cool to, to kind of hear. Like I'll have someone from Rebel call me up and say, Hey, someone just talked to us about marketing objectives, but we know those aren't marketing objectives. Like, Oh yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. We, we talked about marketing objectives. That's, that's the, I guess that's the first one. The second one is, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and so those are some of the things that not necessarily from a organization and a people standpoint, but really in the consumer facing communication. Uh, so being able to, to kind of pilot and or shepherd some of those things at an organization that is already an amazing organization like Rebel and kind of being afforded the opportunity to, to teach an organization to, to learn and grow uh, in a different area was really cool. Yeah, and what's interesting is you talked about you're working on Ziploc, which is like an incredibly low involvement category. You're talking about sandwich bags. And then you were at Red Bull and you talk about signing athletes and I see the Muhammad Ali poster behind you. And I would imagine this is pivoting to our next uh, part of the discussion that you are a big fan of, uh, of sports. And so was I it, I imagine that like your passion meeting your work life when you joined Red Bull was something that was new for you, certainly for, relative to SC Johnson. Did you find that that injected you with sort of more energy um, towards your career so that you were able to actually work on something that interested you out of work? Is this for, for Red Bull in particular? Oh, yeah, for Red Bull and then, you know, currently in Fanatics. Like, like is working in sport much more like, you know, obviously you learned a lot at SC Johnson, but now you're at Red Bull. You, then you were into Red Bull and then Fanatics where you got to work on the sports. And as a sports yeah. fan, does that make work so much more fun? Does that make it, you so much more passionate towards work? Yeah, absolutely. It, it does. So a, a transition, I'll transition from SC Johnson to Rebel and then Rebel to, yeah. to, to Fanatics. Please. The, the, the one thing um, that I always tell people um, the, from going from SC Johnson to Rebel, because I wasn't exactly sure if that was the right move. Yeah. Uh, the last conversation I had 
was with their current global CMO. He asked me one question, which was a bit of rhetoric. And he asked me, when's the last time you did something for the first time? It was a rhetorical question. Um, he said, that's what Red Bull is about. Um, we're in the business of doing things for the first time. I love I'm that. sold. Like at that point, you got me. Like that, like if you can think about, and that's, that's kind of not the downfall, but when you start to do things process, again, SC Johnson, it's not necessarily a downfall, but you kind of do things that are kind of proven. And yeah. Ripple, uh, they do things that are kind of proven, but they also want to be the, the, the first to do things sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's fast follow, especially in the area of sports. And so the other thing as we go from Red Bull to, to Fanatics, yeah, where I started yeah. to enjoy is Red Bull started to expand um, culture marketing. Uh, so things in music and things in dance. Uh, and there's this intersection where sports meets technology, meets media, uh, meets culture and fashion, where Red Bull was playing. I'm like, this is, this is awesome. So as I, I transitioned to, to Fanatics, the question for me was, is there a place where I can do sports and culture and media and still sell a product and still be kind of the, 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 the great person that I want to be and make an impact uh, the way that I want to make an impact? And insert Fanatics, um, heavy in sports. Uh, and so, uh, of course, I knew about Fanatics. I knew about some of the, some of the brands and started having conversations, or conversations with, the, with the leaders leaders there, and they talked about this idea of expanding categories, more specifically in the collectibles area. Yeah. Uh, and the ideas were really more, how do you take a great opportunity with some of the levers that we have? We have lead partnerships and rights. Uh, anything we have, uh, anything you can think of, we have, access or it's coming. Access to the athletes. Yeah, and you have access athletes. to the Content. athletes. Yeah. Right, and you've got a leadership team that's willing to smartly invest uh, for success. So you, you've, you've got sports, um, which is amazing. Uh, we have opportunities with content. So there's an opportunity for, for content, uh, especially as you start to think about original content that you can do with athletes um, or short form content where you have an opportunity to leverage some of those social media things. So that checks the box. Uh, there's an opportunity, obviously, with trading cards, physical and digital uh, from a product standpoint. It's like, okay, that sounds really cool. Oh, yeah. What about, what about culture? It's like, all right, well, there is a place where sports, this is the words from the folks in Fanatics, there's a place where there's an intersection where sports meets culture, meets fashion, meets content, meets technology. Music uh, and too, that right? could, yeah. yeah, and and that could be the future of Fanatics. Like, this is perfect. Like, so to be able to get into an organization like Fanatics uh, at kind of what I'd say the, the ground floor in a, a business like Collectibles, um, where we have an opportunity to have an intersection of all those things, as you mentioned, uh, culture, meaning music, dance, entertainment, uh, sport, uh, fashion, as well as technology, all wrapped up in a product. It's like it was one of those things that's, it's hard to pass up. Yeah. I mean, it's an incredibly exciting opportunity. So you joined earlier this year. What was the most surprising, as CMO of Fanatics Collectibles, I should say, um, what was the most surprising thing you learned about the organization more broadly since you've been there? where you didn't think it would be something that you'd be able to lever. And since you've been there, you're like, oh, wow, this is actually here that you hadn't thought of. The people, actually. It is yeah. like I've heard, I've heard two uh, different analogies when you describe the leadership at uh, Fanatics. Yesterday, someone called the leadership uh, a Delta Force. Um, the, the, the other analogy I've heard was it, it's, it's like the Avengers. Like seriously, like walking through kind of the hallways, it's like a, it's like a who's who in, in, in senior leadership. Yeah. Everyone's so humble. Everyone's done so many different things that it's an opportunity to really kind of learn and, and digest. When you're a, you're a CMO, what you're used to is being the one who kind of educates and teaches and you've got some folks that you want to mentor. Um, the peers, like it's, there's a lot of big fish who are yeah. very humble and they know so many things. Uh, some of them have been in sports, some of them have not been in sports. And so being able to kind of work with these folks from uh, and to assemble with these folks, uh, if I can use a, an Avengers reference, it's been really, really cool. Something I actually didn't expect. Um, I also didn't expect the humility uh, that the organization has. Uh, the passion for sports and the ability to, to leverage sports uh, was something I did expect. Um, the one thing I was, I was curious about is I love sports. I didn't want to get sports fatigue. Um, and that has not happened uh, 
at all. Uh, it's it's not even not even close. It's just really really. Powerful. I don't think I could ever get sports fatigue. I don't know if that's even yeah. possible. Uh, yeah, you know, you want to you want to do something that you love, but if you do it too much, like like if I get, if I go on a mountain and I snowboard. After a while, I was like, yeah, I don't really want to do this anymore. Yeah, <laughs> but, I hear you. Right. but I like it for the first couple of times. I was worried a little bit about them, but you're, but you're right. Like, that, that hasn't happened. I don't appreciate right. it Not to mention, you mentioned this, Fanatics is so much now, they're broadening the horizon beyond sports. And it's a technology company they're getting into gaming. We'll, we'll get into that. So let's start with the collectible space. So the collectible space obviously exploded during the pandemic. Um, yeah. You know, the Michael Jordan documentary, um, you know, really exploded the sports card industry. It boomed just like every other, uh, you know, commodity based, um, you know, industry. It kind of had a bust cycle um, as interest rates started to rise. But, you know, the, the rise in collectible is certainly here to stay. I don't know if you were at the National or not, uh, which is the I annual, was. Big, I'm sure you were, the big sports card event. Over 100,000 people showed up, which is, I think, their largest audience ever. Um, and I really think it signals that. You know, the, just the the growing popularity of fanatics really across all demographics is exploding. And now, you know, collectibles has gone from a cardboard, you know, card to uh, going to where we went through an era where there was uh, limited edition numbered collectibles, autographed. There's patches in cards, and now we're going to a world where things are becoming digitized. And we have NFT level collectibles and. As you mentioned earlier, Fanatics has kind of put together this incredible mix of assets, um, whether it be access to athletes, licensing, um, you know, the, the whole NFT platform that you have with uh, Candy Digital. And it's really, I would think, a marketer's dream to take a category that has had some success, but really sort of a highly fragmented group of players that weren't well capitalized. And here comes Fanatics, where you have probably have an opportunity to really reinvent the category of collectibles for the new generation. So how yeah. are you looking at the opportunity at Fanatics and what are some of the things that you're working on right now to kind of move that vision forward? Yeah, I share your enthusiasm and your excitement about the opportunity, especially as a marketer. Uh, one thing really quickly, we no longer have Candy Digital. Uh, okay. So that was something oh, that good to know. we kind of okay. k- moved on from, uh, actually prior to, to my time. You guys but, are moving so but, fast, I can't even keep, it, keep up with you. Yeah, <laughs> right? Exactly. Uh, but from a collectible standpoint, if, if you if you have if you know the the history of, of let's just start trading cards, trading cards are over 150 years old, right? Yeah. Like it, it was 155 years ago where that first trading card was inserted into a pack of cigarettes to, to keep yeah. the cigarettes fresh. 1909, right? 1909, yeah. uh, you know, high yeah. cop card. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly, yeah. exactly. And then the if you think about the industry leader in trading cards, uh, tops. Tops is over 70 years old, right? And so it's, it's a heritage brand. It's nostalgia. It's, it's classic. Uh, and so what's interesting, the efforts and levels of marketing have mostly been organic. Um, it's not a category that's been marketed heavily. Um, yeah. there's a bit of a scarcity principle. Uh, from a trading card perspective, there are folks who collect it for the extrinsic value and investment purposes and, that's where a lot of the publicity, but most of the folks collect because they love the hobby. Yeah. Um, if I if I use a an analogy, um, uh, sneakers. Um, there are a lot of folks who collect sneakers with the intent to to actually sell them. Uh, but if you go into my yeah, if you go into my closet, I mean, you'll see a bunch of sneakers that I'll probably never wear, uh, right. and I'll never I'll, I'll never actually sell them because I just I just love the the opportunity to collect, and that's what we have. Uh, with respect to the collectibles business. So it gets back to the point we were talking about earlier, which is how do you leverage the assets that you have at athletes and access to athletes and partnerships with the leagues uh, to really, for a new consumer, expose that consumer um, and have them explore uh, the the art of collecting uh, and enjoy the hobby. Uh, And so it's one of the reasons why uh, there's three reasons uh, ultimately why I ended up here at Collectibles, and that's kind of the first one. The the first is the, the job is to grow the number of collectors uh, within the hobby while maintaining the value of the product and the service, uh, yeah. which is an amazing challenge as a marketer. Like you you don't want to flood the market with cards because once you do that, then the value starts to diminish. Of course. Uh, you don't want to have people waiting around in lines uh, because then the service is bad. So what's that balance, right? And so that's kind of like an amazing opportunity as a marketer. The scarcity second, what, and, imagine scarcity and access, basically. Yes, exactly. Right. With with 
with an amazing amount of, of assets to do, to do so. So how do you, how do you pick and choose from basketball to football to, to baseball to, to combat via UFC or entertainment like WWE? Like, how do you do some of those things? Uh, in, in, in a way that, that actually, actually makes sense. So that's one piece. The second piece, as we talked about, was an opportunity to, to, to be culturally relevant and inspirational in your communication to the collectors, to the fans, to the community. Yeah. Uh, and so that's where the marketing comes in because Leverage now you have a, yes. So now yeah. you have an opportunity to actually create, uh, the messaging, uh, based on a really strong brand like Tops with the backing of a brand that's growing like Fanatics. Uh, and so if you think about like just history, like uh, Fanatics as an, as an organization is really only about a decade old. Uh, it's yeah. different from Tops um, from 75 years. And I'd say the, Fanatic, the makeup of- say Fanatics acquired, Fanatics acquired Tops. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so, so Fanatics acquired Tops in 2022. Uh, yeah. So, but Fanatics previous to that is, was, was a decade old. Um, yeah. And even now versus three years ago, I mean, and I know we'll talk about it, there's three, depending on who you are, there's three to five different businesses within the Fanatics organization, uh, which is all kind of built on this opportunity to, to focus on the passion of, of sports and telling stories uh, that will allow us to, to understand kind of a collector, a fan, a consumer, a shopper. Uh, and then the last thing really quickly is world class. So you have an opportunity to take a what I would consider a senior leadership team that is world class uh, and make an entire marketing organization world class, an entire product line world class. And so all those things are just, you're right, it's a marketer's dream to be able to be uh, in that situation. Yeah, and I think what a lot of people who aren't in the hobby, you don't collect, understand is it's not about always the thing. It's about the story behind the thing. So if you talk to people, because right now all of our photos are in the cloud. So if you used to ask people if your house was on fire, what would you grab? They'd say, my old photos. But that's not really the case anymore. Now, if you ask a Yankees fan what you grab, and you know, and, and he was around in the 50s and 60s, he'd say, my signed Mickey Mantle ball, my signed Jordan yeah. Maggio ball. And a lot of people who aren't collectors will say, well, it's just a baseball. Can't you replace it? But that guy might have gotten that signed ball with his dad, who's no longer around. And yeah. that ball is really a memory of that moment. And I think, you know, I, I, I'm a collector and I go to shows with my son and it's not about the thing. It's about, it, it really is, is about the bond that, that has created with me and my son. And it really is, it transcends from a physical thing to an experience, which gives it sort of an emotional layer on top of the physical item that a collector collectible is, which I think yeah. is something that is so powerful um, in terms of the space that you play in. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. It is a celebration of a moment. That thing yeah. does represent something that is that is greater. It's a it's a memory. Like you ask a collector about their favorite item, their favorite item. It's not necessarily about the item. It's what that item reminds them of. And in yeah. that, there are great stories uh, and there's great history with it. And so, what we like to say with the with the trading cards, especially with the ones that we offer now, is it's a celebration of the, of those moments. Have your your piece of history. Uh, on the tops, we have a, a tops now program, which, yeah. you know, we try to capture moments, like things in the moment and celebrate them and say, Hey, do you remember this moment? And one of the ones I thought was really, really cool is, uh, you'll remember this on August 30th, Lincoln, Nebraska, over 90,000 in Memorial Stadium, uh, to watch a women's volleyball game. Uh, mm -hmm. and so we created a tops now card to really, not, I mean, it's not to, to sell it to make money. It's really more to, to celebrate that moment and what it represents for someone who's there. It's like, yeah, I could take my own picture, but I remember this moment. And to kind of have that in like kind of in your history uh, as yeah. a moment to celebrate is you really cool own to own the that. moment. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's exactly. You actually own a piece of the moment. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. Another great um, thing that, and I could talk about this forever and, and we won't because I, I want to respect your time, but uh, you know, the, one of the activations you guys did with major league baseball, where, the rookie players wore a patch and then you're going to put those patches, actually the actual patch that the rookie played in their first game into a card, which you could get in the pack, which I just yeah. think it's like to be able to connect that moment with that player. It's a one of one moment and then you can own it. I just think that's just a tremendous idea. And that's a great example of fanatics connecting, you know, the ability that since you create the jerseys and you have the trading card company, you can kind of connect those two, integrate those two assets into something powerful that's really never been done that way before. 
For sure. And I think the other thing uh, that's allowed us to do that is the amazing partnerships that Fanatics has with the leagues. So with yeah. the, the, the relationship with Major League Baseball, the relationship with Major League Baseball Players Association allowed that to, to happen. I didn't realize how much of a, I'll say, quote unquote, controversy of what is the actual rookie card of yeah. was until I joined Fanatics. Uh, and then when we started to talk about putting this rookie debut pack uh, kind of for the one time that that player uh, makes it to the, the major leagues and they play in the game, it was kind of like overwhelming. The feedback is now we've ended the debate. It rises the true rookie out. card right. is. Yeah. And so it's, it's to see kind of the reaction of the industry, of the collectors, of the hobby, especially those in baseball to say, wow, this is, this is amazing. I got to have that card. I got to have that moment, especially for, for their players and the ones that they root for. It's been really cool to see that. Yeah. And when you talk about the, the merging of fanatics into culture, you know, there's also a kind of a rising sector of trading cards and collectibles for non-athletes. Um, mm -hmm. whether it be, um, you know, musicians or whether it be, you know, comedians, you name it. Is that an area that you guys see a lot of growth, even entrepreneurs? Um, do you guys see a lot of growth in that area moving forward? Is that an area you also have your eye on? We do, for sure. And so in one of the brands that we, Fanatics, did acquire was a brand called Zero Cool. Zero Cool, yeah. And Zero Cool uh, has been focused on kind of culture and entertainment. So there are things that are non-sports that we do right now, uh, such as uh, we'll do uh, Star Wars, so Tops has Star Wars cars, as well as, if you remember, Garbage Pail Kids, those are still around, uh, so we do those as well. But also, there is a, a mixing of sport, culture, entertainment, music, and products that we have right now. So uh, this week, actually, we released this product called Alan and Ginter, uh, and Alan and Ginter kind of one of the, the older uh, kind of brands uh, that, that's out there. But it is a mix of it is a mix of, of baseball, um, music, entertainment, and so in that set you'll see baseball players uh, like a like a Mike Trout or a Julio Rodriguez, but you'll also see a Kevin Hart. You know, you'll see a Robert De Niro. You'll That's see a so little cool. baby. Yeah, it, it is really cool to to, to kind of have and those extend your market as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and and, and you've got autographs of those folks as well, which is like all right. right, this is I can get a Kevin Hart autograph, Alan Ginter card. That's pretty cool. That is. That's awesome. So shifting yeah. gears a little bit um, as we wrap up. So the, this space is changing so much and the consumer is changing so much. What do you do personally to kind of keep your finger on the pulse of the consumer so you are able to jump on all, you know, any new emerging trend that pops up in such a dynamic business like Fanatics? Yeah. You know, I actually started, uh, what I'm going to tell you, I actually started this when I, in my time at S.C. Johnson, someone gave me the advice. Um, you, you almost have to have your own selection of a focus group of folks you can tap into yeah. because they will know things before you know things because you yeah. spend all your day kind of doing the things that you do. Uh, and they spend all the things, all their days doing the things that you want to motivate them to do. And so having kind of like that, that personal group, that personal focus groups, especially in collecting, uh, allows me to kind of understand the collecting aspect of it. Uh, and then from a, a sports standpoint, there's no shortage of opportunities yeah. uh, to learn a little bit about sports and you, you name it, there's an app for it. And, and so for me, it's really more about how do you set up and structure your team so that they actually have the opportunity uh, to understand kind of the, the way that the, the wind will blow. Like a uh, perfect example. Um, I don't know, maybe you would have done it, Matt, but two, three years ago, or not even two, three years, two, three months ago, uh, would we have been able to predict what was going to happen in Boulder, Colorado, uh, with respect to the Buffaloes and, and coach Probably. prime. We right. heard it like, everyone was like, Oh, they're going to go one 11. Uh, they right. may win two games. I'll right. give them three, maybe three. Uh, and now just at least as a marketer and watching from afar, it's all you want to talk now, about when it comes to college football. It, it is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It is amazing what has happened. And so having someone to be there on the, on the pulse. And I remember being in a meeting and someone was saying, Hey, we should do something with Travis Hunter. Um, and I think someone else said, wait, who is that? And that was like four weeks ago, right? It's like, right. we, we kind of understand how things how change, things so, change so quickly, right? And so you just have to, have to be on it. Yeah. And if you look at the story of Colorado, the reason I think it's hitting such a nerve with the consumer is it's about the underdog. You have Dion, who obviously is an icon. You know, and then it's about family because his kids are on the team. So it really just like hits on so many different points that kind of crosses over or transcends sports even into a broader story. 
and that's why I think it's drawing so many people in. It reminds me of almost like Tim Tebow, how, you know, he was religious and he brought in a whole different group of not casual fans into Florida football. It's sort of, th- that's what it reminds me of. Yeah, for sure. I would say, like, um, I'm, I'm a fan of Coach Prime as a marketer. Uh, yeah. And what I always like to tell people is if you watch a Buffalo's game, uh, look at the sideline and look at the number of folks who are capturing content, organic oh content. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Like that is, that is a very great, it is a very good marketer. So I'll look at it. i look out for a deal with uh, Fanatics and, uh, and, and Coach Prime moving forward. I'll keep an eye on that. Um, He's but, a hard one to get to. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. So finally here, Ken, I mean, you've obviously had a, a great career. And, I, you know, it, it's not lost to me that you put in the work, whether it's getting your MBA, cutting your teeth at SC Johnson, that gave you sort of the blocking and tackling and fundamentals that allowed you to succeed at Red Bull and put you in a great position as CMO of Fanatics Collectibles to really – be able to reinvent an incredibly exciting category. Um, if you look back on your career, what are some of the things that you think you did right that maybe we can impart on some of our younger listeners here um, so they can one day end up with a career like yours and sit in the seat that you're in? I'd say the, the, the most important thing, there's probably two things. One, um, you have to deliver results with integrity. Integrity meaning just do what you say you're going to do. It, it's such an easy thing, uh, but it is so hard uh, to, to do sometimes because sometimes we don't realize we're outside of integrity. If you and I, Matt, say we're going to meet for lunch at noon uh, and I show up at 12.05 and I don't acknowledge it, then I'm outside of integrity. Uh, and that's such a small thing, but it means so much uh, with yeah. respect to, to others. Uh, the, the second thing is having clarity on a couple of things. One, you have to have clarity on what it is that you want to do. Not necessarily from a a role perspective, but you have to put some thought into the things that you like to do, the things you don't like to do. For me, I've had a career journal for decades now where I'm still writing in there, hey, here are the things that I want to, here are the things I want to do. So you want to be, you want to be able to to have clarity on what it is you you want to do. You want to be able to deliver results. Uh, and I would say, don't be, if, if there's one thing I wish I would have done earlier, uh, it's the power of the network. And I don't yeah, think I, I actually started to, to, I don't think I started to build a network, uh, until someone asked me why I wasn't building a network. And this was after Kellogg. So yeah, I haven't really thought about it. Like, what's that for? Like being able to do those things early on, uh, number one, it's lifelong friends that you have an opportunity because you're not actually talking to them because you want something. Uh, but being able to have kind of a, 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 a group where you can reach into uh, to get advice or thoughts or, or even pick their brain on some things, that's been kind of a game changer for me. A hundred percent. Yeah, I, I can't yeah. think of many things more important in your career than the power of the network, especially at times where you're switching careers or you need help with something that's who you lean into. Um, yeah. And the network is also two ways. Like one thing I often find with our younger employees is they mm-hmm. want me to call and ask for a favor of some exec I know. And my whole thing is, well, I want to add value first. You can't just take, take, take. A network is, is two ways. And yet you have to yeah. give over time as well and figure out how you can add value yourself for sure. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So, so well again, said. finally here, is, is there a quote or mantra you like to live by? Is there something that, that comes that comes to mind if I ask that question? Yeah, I, I I used to, not used to, I still talk to folks about this idea of the power of one. Uh, so you never know, um, the difference that the number one can make. It can be one team, one goal, one objective, one business, uh, one conversation that you have with a stranger, uh, one word, and that word can be hello. Uh, and the impact that you can make on, on someone's life is amazing. So I'll tell you a quick story from the natural, um, uh, quick story, uh, I am in the, there's, I mean, it's 100,000 people. It is like one of those things where it's like, you know, at, at some point, it's, you're, you're bumping into people. It's kind of tight and it, it's snug. And uh, I remember I was, I was in the bathroom um, and I'm like, all right, this is, this is a lot. This is my first national. I'm not sure if I'm getting out of it, but I'm supposed to get out of it. And there's a guy behind me uh, and he were washing our hands. Uh, the only thing he said was, hello, um, how you doing? Uh, I looked to my right and it was Derek Jeter and that's all he really said, but it was like, all right, this is worth it. Like, like if I can go to, to, to a bathroom and see the captain next to me and he, he didn't have to say anything at all. Um, but the fact that he decided to, to say something and, uh, and even ask, 
how's it going? It, it was one of those moments where it kind of brought me back to like, there's a, there's a power and just speaking and saying hello and putting down your phone on the elevator and trying to have a conversation. Versus the opposite of one, which is zero, which is doing nothing where, yeah. you know, it, it's like you only make the, Wayne Gretzky said, you only make the shots you take. I mean, if you're not taking a shot, you have no chance of anything coming out because there is no. Absolutely way. right. Absolutely right. Well, Ken, this has been amazing. Uh, seriously, one of my favorite interviews on the podcast to date, and we've had many. So thank you so much for joining. I can't wait for our listeners to hear this. It was awesome. And I wish you nothing but success in, in this exciting new role of yours. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Absolutely. On behalf of Susie and Adobe team, thanks again to Ken Turner, CMO at Fanatics Collectibles, for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. The Speed of Culture is brought to you by Susie as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and AGAS Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for The Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.